Welcome to the Rex Chapman Show with super cool Josh Hopkins, powered by BasketballNews.com. Hey, Josh, how are you, buddy? Good, man. How's everything in Kentucky? Everything, uh, it's, it's warming up here, heating up, I should say. Mm-hmm. I'm old. I, I want to brag. I went on two big walks yesterday. Ooh, yeah, yeah. that's a uh, yeah. congratulations. Thanks, buddy. You know, I yeah. got my heart rate up a little bit and uh, took my shirt off. <laughs> Only in the neighborhood, though, trying to get my get my tan on, my, get mm-hmm. my gun mm-hmm. right for summer. You know how it goes. Got you, guy. I feel you. I feel you. Oh, uh, we should jump right into uh, the segment book club. Uh, yes. what, have you read, read anything this week, Rex? Not at all. Me either. So that's been book club. Rex, I do have a question I've been thinking about. I just popped into my head today. I like when you, you think? do this. I like when Thanks. you do this. You're welcome. Who are the, are the Currys the Mannings of the NBA or are the Mannings the Currys of the NFL? Hmm? Oh. That makes my brain hurt. I mean, yeah, uh, it's tough, but the the, the fathers played and were, were, were great. And then the two boys come out and are great titles, a lot of titles there. They seem to be like the basketball and football Camelots. My knee jerk is to say the Mannings. And the only reason I do that is because I... I don't know that Seth is going to be a starting point guard on a title team unless he wins one this year, you know, in Philly. Uh, Archie, Archie Manning, a great pro, but had uh, just, you know, awful awful line and terrible team. Um, Had a great career. Dell, great career, six man of the year, a time worth two maybe um also one of the best guys ever but never an all-star mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. man stefan has set the world on fire of course peyton has but did eli win two super bowls he did he did the helmet catch that's uh that, that's that may be a but also stefan and seth are still playing so yeah that's a work in progress so yeah, it's, it's i guess it's yet to be decided but i don't know i mean if Seth ends up being on a team that wins a couple, you know, and, and who knows, Steph changed the game, changed the entire game. Like, I don't know that. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he revolutionized the sport. I mean, they were both great quarterbacks, but the revolution has been with quarterbacks that can move now. More. Yeah. But know, let's, that's, not, let's not poo poo Peyton because Peyton, man. Oh, he's, he, he was just player. a maestro, you yeah, know, yeah. he was, he was, you know, you could say robotic and all of that stuff, but at the line and what he was able to accomplish with his mind. Omaha, and, Omaha. Yeah. And communication with everybody on that line that that's elite. And, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know that anybody's done that part of it better. Um, and he's a hell of a pitch man, funny in the commercial. So that's, you know, that's something. Stefan ain't bad. Stephanie ain't bad. He's 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 got some gigs. He's got mm-hmm, some personality. Mm-hmm, don't mm-hmm, you? No doubt. Don't you poo poo on my Stephanie? We we have to have Seth on here. Oh yeah, the trilogy. Absolutely. I'd love to hear his stories, his side of I can't wait the backyard games. Oh yeah, Steph's got all kinds of swag. He he's all as you can imagine, all kinds of toughness. Seth, I think he's probably according to. Their father, I think Seth is the only guy in the NBA who thinks he's a better shooter than Steph. And he might be. <laughs> it's percentage-wise. It might be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, what do we got today? You know what we got? We got a little twist. We've got the CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports Entertain- Entertainment, which is encompasses the Sixers, the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, the Prudential Center. We have Scott Michael O'Neill, an executive wow. with many, many, many accolades. So I'm really yeah. excited about this one. How about you, Josh? I'm, I'm a little nervous. Yeah. I mean, he's an intellect beyond mine. Uh, Harvard Business School. I'm out right there. I'm like, uh, uh, what's your favorite color? I don't know what I'm going to ask this guy. Same, 
So, very much the same. He's one of those I'm excited. that remember the old movie. It was Meryl Streep and uh, it was defending your life, Albert Brooks. And they had the whole thing. Some people are the little brains and some people are the big brains. Scott O'Neill is a big brain guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm excited to talk to him because I feel like I'm going to learn something. Yeah, me too. Let's get to it. You want to, buddy? I'd love to. Let's roll. Scott Michael O'Neill. Welcome to the <laughs> show, buddy. Hey, um, I know you do the preset when you talk about that neither of you read a book. Here's a tip. <laughs> Put this one on your list and read it. <laughs> All right. Uh, there we go, uh, right away. You know, like a, one time I want to hear say, yeah, I read this great book. It was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I love you guys. Love your work. Love your podcast. Thrilled to be here and humbled to be here and hope to have some fun. And, and if you don't have any questions for me, I got some for you. <laughs> oh, I love it. Already I'm in. Well, for people that don't know, you're the CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, the Sixers, the Devils, Prudential Center, all of that good stuff. Uh, formerly Madison Square Garden, the NBA for years. Um, t- talk to us, Scott, for a second about growing up. Did you play ball? Uh, all of that. You went to Villanova, yeah. know, but growing up, give us your background. Yeah, on that. Yes. Uh- Total, total hoop junkie. Um, dad, my dad was the freshman basketball coach at Holy Cross. So his, his coaching career didn't last very long, but he coached me since I could walk. I had a basketball in my hands. I still play today. I'm 51 years old and would take, I would just literally go anywhere, anytime to hear the ball bouncing. Um, I got Jay Wright, who was an assistant coach under Raleigh when I was a freshman, cut me from the team. You should ask him sometime how that went for him. Not so well. Um, but it was, I love the, I love, I've gotten so much from the game of basketball. I, I coach my daughters. I've got three daughters. None of them are very good. They're wonderful kids, but the game of basketball teaches every value that helps you be successful in life. It's about, um, fighting, competing, sweating, leading, following, learning how to lose, which I've never still not very good at learning how to win with grace, which I'm getting better at. Um, you understanding about like, how to compete. You walk on a court, man, you walk on a pickup court and you get that little anxiety before because you don't know anybody. You walk into a foreign city and play. I love that. I love the uncomfortableness. I love the little wink and the nod when something good happens. Um, Boy, man, everybody needs an escape from the world. And mine is just hearing that ball bounce. Now I I, I love the game. I hear you have some, uh, you know, pretty infamous pregame hoops games uh, in Philadelphia. Yeah, I mean, yeah. legs are gone, shots kind of almost always there, but the mouth never stops moving. <laughs> that's that's my gift. Okay, everybody was given a gift. I didn't have your jumper, didn't have your hops, didn't, didn't have anything you have, but this I compete at a world class level still. It just keeps getting better. That's the one, one part of the game that never goes away. Oh, that's funny. Must Scott. be something in the water, you and Danny Ainge both. Uh, I got to keep an eye on both <laughs> you. Guys. Yeah, yeah Scott, sure. man, I say this with the utmost respect and as a high compliment, but you are the kind of person that really makes me feel shitty about myself. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> have accomplished so much. You are so uh, um, successful. Uh, uh, your commitment to community, your passion. Uh, where did, did were you born with this? I know all your siblings are very successful. Do you have the best parents oh, ever? Is it something in your DNA? What? what How did you accomplish all this? Oh, you're too funny. Uh, I, w- I will say that my, my book, Be Where Your Feet Are, is actually about the exact opposite of that. So I've, I've read plenty of books. And, um, and the one uh, the one thing I love is uh, stories of, of failure. And, how, and uh, I think that's where all the learning takes place. And um and so me growing up, I, I, grew, like I was a food stamp kid when I was really young. So uh, we, we didn't come from a lot of means. And then I saw my folks go from that, like puffed milk and powdered, you know, powdered milk and puffed rice, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, to like <clears throat> all of a sudden I'm at a country club. And I'm like, wow, this is different. And then they lost it again. So, so I had a wonderful, and I, I only say that it's a wonderful experience because when you don't have any money, you don't know what money is. Like you have an appreciation for it. You have, you have no idea what anybody else has. This is before social media. We, we just, you know, I just knew my neighbor drove a semi. Like that's, that was life, you know? And then my folks um, did very well in their business and they're entrepreneurs. So things went bad and things went really well and then they went badly. Um, but man, I grew up in a house totally full of love. Um, 
both my, my, my mom and dad, um, both had their PhDs, um, child education, child psychology. So it was a laboratory. And my dad told me every single day, I, I try to sell my daughters and hope it works. They told me every day, my mom and my dad, you can achieve anything you want to achieve. Dream big. Don't let anybody put a ceiling on you. If you can dream it, you can do it. I mean, every day. Can you imagine having that just pounding in your head every single day? And with all the negativity that we find in the world today, and by the way, that's one thing, Rex, I just love, 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 love. And I know some of your biggest fans only know you from social media, which I think is funny, but I love positive energy. And Twitter is a cesspool of hate. And you bring love and laughs and, and, there's, and, and social change and meaning and purpose. And, um, and so, yes, I, uh, I'm sorry to, to wander, but I was really fortunate. I grew up in a house of five kids within six years, total like Irish Catholic Italian family. Um, so we had a lot of emotion in there, a lot of love, a lot of hugs, a lot of kisses, um, and a lot of dreams. We all played hoop. Um, my sister was the only real athlete. She was like all American in high school, American in college in lacrosse. Um, but, but generally we were just like those scrappy, nasty Irish point guards that you never wanted to play. Pick up in 95 degrees and pick you up full court and get right in your ass. Every possession. Be like, I hate the O'Neal's. Um, those, yeah, my brothers are a lot of nice. None bro. of them. Fuck. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't want it. You did, you never wanted it. You, you could have been better, faster, stronger, but you did not want us on the court with you. Uh, so yeah, we we competed. I mean, we threw punches in the backyard, and it was it was a it was a full on melee every time we played. Uh, but we we grew up uh, tough kids. All it was a family five point guards. So family point guards. Uh, so we were we were always. Past first kids, um, because my dad was a coach, you know, that was kind of the way we were brought up. Because none of you could shoot, just say hand. it. Because none of you could shoot, just go ahead and say it. Uh, I listen, uh, listen, we have a family <laughs> family saying that what, what we lack in talent, we make up for in confidence. So <laughs> we were shooters, we just weren't makers. Are you guys, um, because you're all hyper successful, are you competitive today with one another? With your siblings? No, competitive. You know, it's almost like the NBA. Like I've been, I've been blessed to be around the game for so long, and you know, work for David Stern and work for Adam Silver, and these incredible like, leaders and luminaries. And the one thing that that I got pounded into my head really quickly when I got into this league was that we fight to the death on the court, and we help each other off the court. And that's the way my brothers are and my sister. And um, so they're my they're my best friends in the world. Um, they're the ones I call when things go well, and they're the ones I call when things don't go so well. You know, and I, I've had plenty of those moments too. So, uh, so I, no, I, I, we're not. We don't have any kind of competition. All we're doing is rooting for each other. I kind of the way I see the world. Um, I never really understood kind of the jealousy gene. I I root for every everybody. You know, I want everybody to get a raise. I want everybody to get promoted. I want everyone to sell their company. I I, I think the world is better when when people are winning, and uh, and I, especially with my friends. I like the cut of your jib, man. Same. You are. I keep you around. You inspire me. Yeah, there's. I do want to ask this before we really go on. What does a CEO of a professional sports organization do? Like, I know what the GM, the coach, the players. What What's your day to day job? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think if you talk to the people I, that I work with, they tell you not enough. <laughs> um, but I, I, I mean, no, but I. Um, you know, it's a big business. You know, when, when I when I got into this league, I worked for the New Jersey Nets, the, the beloved New Jersey Nets with Derek Coleman and Kenny Anderson, Drazen Petrovic, if you remember. Um, so that was not Sam Bowie, Chris Morris. That wasn't a, a beloved team, um, but the business was really small. I remember starting there and reading that the Jazz just traded for $13 million. And you look today and you got teams <laughs> trading over $2 billion. So the organizations, when I walked into this game 25 years ago, were this big. And now they're big businesses with big brands. Um, so, so our responsibility is effectively to, you know, as a CEO, you set the strategy for the company. Um, you drive the budget. You hire and fire. Um, you set the culture. We're, we aim to create the greatest place to work in the world. And we're, we're far from that, but that's our aim. That's our goal. And we're trying to drive social change. I, I operate in, in cities that need help, like Newark, New Jersey. And if you haven't been there, I'd love to take you on a car ride. Camden, New Jersey is the average household income, $13,000. You know, Philadelphia is a second highest poverty rate of any major U.S. city behind only Detroit, lovely Detroit. 
and uh, in Wilmington, which was known as Kilmington when it was the murder capital of the U.S. Uh, three years ago. So I'm in cities that need help. So that's one thing we do is try that. Um, I manage our board, you know, Josh Harris and David Blitzer and Michael Rubin are these incredible luminary guys who have day jobs. So I run the business for them and make sure that they're comfortable with the decisions we make, but it's more strategy and growth. I mean, when I got there, it was just a team. We built an incredible training center and bought the devils and prudential center and set up a venture fund, a real estate company, esports business, a sports marketing company. So I'm, you know, in charge of growth and development. It's a, it's a classic like CEO job. Um, and then I interact if, you know, with the basketball crew, if they ever need a little help or assistance or things go south. Do you want to get an advantage over the sports books during the NBA and NHL playoffs? How about an inside edge this MLB season? Then download BetQL, the only app you'll need to make smart bets. Their best bets algorithm scans over 350,000 bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and gives you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. BetQL also has tons of other tools like sharp data so you can see who the pros are backing and line movement so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time. Plus, you can save all your picks in one place to track your success and winning streaks, as well as view your rank on their leaderboards. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co backslash Rex. Enter the discount code Rex at payment checkout for 25% off of their subscription offerings. Don't miss out on the chance to beat the book this summer you know knowing where the, the franchise came from i played when i played the sixers were terrific you know um and been had been down seeing seeing you guys with the number one seed uh and MVP fun. and defensive player of the year candidates as your corners cornerstones after all this time how does that feel it feels amazing i i will tell you like Going back to that 10 win season, that was hard. Like it was, it was a grind. I mean, it was like, you know, I mean, I do drop my daughter off at school and I got like the little 24 year, year old teacher's aide saying, when are you going to get this team right? And I'm like, not you, you know, no, <laughs> um, but, we, <laughs> but we, you know, Philadelphia, that's a tough town. It's, it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, they, you know, we eat our young for breakfast here and, uh, it's a blue collar city. And, and the good news was, is that people appreciated how we were playing. You know, that was like Isaiah Cannon, TJ McConnell, a Cove. I mean, guys were just out there. Henry Sims. Mm -hmm. I remember I was in one meeting with season tickle. So I did season tickle meetings every day. I did Brett Brown. Oh. And this one guy said, I'm not renewing. If you don't resign Henry Sims. And I was like, Henry Sims, <laughs> you know, that's I, mean, was, I think we had 50. I, I think we had 50 players, 50 yeah. players on the roster that year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there was pressure. I mean, I told, you know, I suggested to my wife and children that they not come to any games um, halfway through the season. Wow. I suggested to my bosses that they not attend any more games for the rest of the year because it was nasty. I, the, I, I'm glad the, you uh, said that because I, you know, look, and it goes without saying luckiest people in the world to be associated with the NBA and yeah. professional sports, but it, it can't be stated enough how hard it is when, you know, I played on a 19 win team and a 20 win team and losing just wears on you. And the only thing that gets you through, through is having good people, because if you don't have good yeah. people there, then it's going to fall apart. What, what inspired you to write oh. this book? What inspired you to write? Be where yeah, well, we are. What, uh, after all these years of sports, what, where, why? <clears throat> Yeah, well, uh, my best friend um, took his own life, and um, and Sorry, I was what age were you? Standing up, I was uh, forty-eight. Gosh, I'm sorry, buddy. And I was standing up there giving his, you know, eulogy, speaking at his funeral. And I'm looking down at these five kids, his beautiful wife, successful guy, and just had all kinds of uh, chemical issues, and um, and I was, I just kept thinking like man, he's like, this is an amazing guy. I went to Harvard Business School with this guy. Like, he is brilliant. I mean, he walked into a room and lit it up. I mean, he was like the bear hug guy, you know? You know those guys in high school that squeezed you too tight and you're like, stop, this hurts? He was that guy and just full of life. And then he was gone. 
And, um, and I just thought, man, we got some lessons. We have lessons and we have to learn them. And so I started writing like, kind of like Forrest Gump was running. I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I started talking to friends in my mind. And I, what I found out was like that, that life that we see on Facebook and Instagram. Um, it's wonderful. I, I love seeing your kids get into Yale or whatever, or being all American or getting into this. It's awesome. Like I honestly, I still want to see them. So I, I don't, I don't disparage anybody from doing that because I love good news and I love connecting with people, but that's not real life. Yeah. And, and real life is what happens behind it. And for me, having been fired from Madison Square Garden and running the company into the ground and having miscarriages with my wife and like, look, man, it's real. I have trouble with one of my daughters. Like, it's this. You want to talk about real life? That's what this book's about. It's like, but that's where the learning takes place. And that's what people don't understand. And instead, we like we hide behind like these beautiful pictures. And I still want to see them. So I don't want to take that away. But I do want people to understand that it's OK. Like, it's going to be OK. Like life is hard. And when you really look to take a step back and, and, and you guys can tell me, it's like, when does your best learning in your life ever taken place? It's when you fall down. You got to pop up. But man, you get in a pothole, you twist your ankle, you fall, you trip, you stumble, you get fired. They write something nasty about you. Hey, you want to do something fun? Google Scott O'Neill, look on Reddit. Okay, go Reddit, Scott O'Neill. That's a, that's a fun place to be, you know? And so you can stay in that space, but that's not space I want to be in. I want to be around people who, who make me smile and I want to be around positive energy and I want to be around life and people of hope and who could dream and think differently. And so, so I, long story is something bad happened and I decided to share some of my most vulnerable moments when my things weren't going so well and some of the lessons I learned. And I got some friends to share some similar ones, um, which shocked me. Like I just didn't, really? you didn't know, like, right. Cause, yeah. cause the picture yeah. of my family is like, Oh, look at that big CEO. Um, Josh, you said in the beginning, like, hey, you know, I feel like, you know, these guys don't at all. Like, hey, guess what? They get a peek behind the curtain. And you're going to feel like really good about yourself when you read this book. You're like, holy crap, you know? And, and that's okay. And because I want people to be okay. I want them to um, understand that this journey that we call life is just full of opportunities to learn and grow. And you get up at the top of that mountain. I got to tell you, look around and it is lonely up there. And so you better, better find another mountain to climb. And so I, I think that's um, that's what why I did it and, and what it's about. Thanks for asking. Really inspiring. Yeah. Thank you for absolutely. thank you. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, so you are creating a culture. You talk about that. You talk about people positivity. And when you are putting a team around you, when you're hiring, what do you look for? Uh, qualities in the people that you put around in your organization and how do you know they <laughs> truly have them? Like um, what do you, just what do you look for in the people you hire? Yeah. Um, energy, um, intellectual curiosity and an unreasonable work ethic. And, and I think those are, are and, you know, I, I want to hire extraordinary teammates as well. Cause that's what creates like the added level of success when you come to our place. Um, but I think that that passion for life, you can see it in their eyes. Um, unreasonable work ethic, you usually know where they where they come from is really helpful. Um, um, and I, I don't mean what You're part of the country. Unreasonable I just mean, work ethic. Unreasonable. Unre unreasonably high work ethic. Yeah, because I, I haven't seen anybody be successful in anything without working unreasonably hard. I, I wish that would. I mean, I, listen. If you ever find something that's simple and easy, like give me a call. I will sign up for that in two seconds. Have you I met just Josh? haven't seen it. You should Josh now. just be an actor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great call. <laughs> great call. But it, I live. It's, it's, I have an unreasonable work ethic. All right. It's just <laughs> it's just the other. One. <laughs> it's on the other end. I miss my yeah. <laughs> No, but please, but I, please I, elaborate I, on that, please. No, I, I will tell you too. I um, I spend a lot of time with a lot of young people. At, at my my, you know, we've got like two thousand people I work with now, and and uh, five hundred full time, and average age is probably twenty six and a half or so. And I spend a lot of time with them talking about exactly that. You know, work hard, be intellectually curious, and be an extraordinary teammate. But I also spend a lot of time these days talking about mind, body, soul stuff because I I have a firm belief that. Um, we've got to do something for our mind and something for our body and something for our soul every day to be mentally healthy. We need a proper amount of sleep. You know, when I was growing up in this business, it was like, 
sleep is for the weak. Yeah. That's what my boss told me. Right. I had another boss tell me like money never sleeps. So you shouldn't either. Now all the sleep research I'm reading, all the people that come in and talk to our teams now, Rex, it's different. Like there's a whole army of people helping yeah. these teams, these players now. It's unbelievable. It's different than it, what it's, it was. A, it's amazing. Though, you, because it's like, I, I think I got hurt. Crazy. I think I got hurt a lot because I was just run down and I didn't sleep well. This was also before sleep aid and AIDS and whatnot. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, of course the guys need their sleep. Of course people need their right. sleep. Well, think about that too. We were running practices at shoot arounds at 10 a.m. Like our guys are asleep at 10 a.m. Right. You know, so, so anyways, there's a lot of stuff we can learn, but, but every day of life is like something for your mind, something for your body, something for your soul every day. And nobody wants to talk about soul and religion. I know that's like something people aren't comfortable talking about. And I say like, you don't have to read scriptures. You don't have to pray, but you do have to find some stillness in your life. Go meditate, go listen to the birds chirp in the morning. Like we all need five minutes of stillness and you have to sleep. I'm, I'm, I mean, you have to. And then I say, be where your feet are, phone down, head up, and then express some gratitude. And the gratitude thing is so simple. It's like the simplest thing. When I talk to groups, I talked to a group today from AstraZeneca, this pharma company. And I, I started the meeting by saying, hey, okay, uh, pick up your phones. And I want you to text your mom. I want you to tell her how much you love her, one thing you learned from her, and why you appreciate her. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, just do it, 60 seconds. But the whole exercise, it's not about your mom. And by the way, moms are so underappreciated. Everybody do that anyway. But I'm like... Can you imagine somebody in your life, like an old coach, an old teacher, an old mentor, someone who worked for you, some trainer that worked on you, you know, some director that helped you, somebody in your life that helped you, and they fly into your head, they give you they get these little promptings, the question, just act on them, just send a note, especially now, people are isolated, they're alone, and one little simple reach out, hey, just checking in, how you doing? Hey, just thinking about you today, just want to tell you I love you and I was thinking about you. Hey, anytime you're in town, please give me a call. I was thinking about you. If we get on a horn later this week, I'd love to talk to you. Those little things, man, I'll tell you, we need to be better and do better. And that's like a little thing we can do to, uh, to help drive change. That's just beautiful. I, uh, you know, I, I'd seen before, uh, trying to find those moments of stillness during the day. And you had mentioned that, you know, that's you're just not wired that way. I'm not either. Josh is definitely not that no. way. I'm always on the go. That's why, you know, uh, social media is great and terrible because then, you know, <laughs> I, I'll find myself with a computer on a, a, a phone in my hand and the TV on. And that's not good for you. That can't be good for you for a no. long time or for any, even a short time. So how do you suggest to people to find, how do you dial back and say, all right, I've got to oh, take great, time great for question. Me. Yeah. So I, I tell you what, I was, I was working for Madison Square Garden and next we're going through that rebuild, the, the dining walls rebuild. And, you know, we lost by 24, got booed off the court and getting booed in New York is just harder. Like Philly is the only harder place I've, I've ever heard booed, but New York is hard. You know, it's not just boo. It's like, boo, I hate you. You know, they just don't say it, but you know they hate you. And, uh, <laughs> and so we, I, I get home and I'm all grouchy and my wife's like, so uh, what's, what's going on? I was like, did you see the game tonight? She's like, yeah, yeah, I saw the game. I was like, she's like, so what's up? I was like, did you see the end? We lost by 24. We got booed. She's like, yeah, so I got booed off the court. So uh, I was like, okay. She's like, how good are your teams this year? The Knicks, Rangers, Liberty. I said, not very good. She's like, okay. Um, so what, like 100 losses? I'm like, yeah, probably 100, maybe a few more. She goes, okay, one out of every three nights, this is going to be you? This ain't going to work. Not for me, not for this house, not this wow. race. I was like, whoa. Whoa. Sure. Yeah. whoa, honey, I love you. Uh -huh. And um, that, that, those kind of things uh, help. And so I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I was like, hey, I got to figure this out because I can't calm down. I can't imagine as a player, like, coming down, like, I don't come down for two, three, four hours depending on the game. Okay. And player, I can't imagine like you getting your psyche and your, your body to calm down. I couldn't do it. And my friend said, Hey, I, I have a worry tree outside of my house. I was like, well, what? He's like, yeah, I drive home, put my hand on this tree and all my worries going to the tree. I was like, I need a tree like that. Of course I don't have one, but we lovely, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yes. So instead I use my ride home. I just use my ride. My ride is like, I can holler at the moon. I call like sometimes one of my brothers would say, you know, crazy stuff that doesn't make any sense that no one else can hear other than, other than they can. Um, and then when I get home, I put the phone down and I become a dad. That's it. I'm a dad. And so, so I, I try to completely compartmentalize and, um, and it's hard though. At work, you come into one of my meetings, you check your phone at the, at the, we have a cell phone table to check it. And you can imagine the, the Gen Z's and they're like, oh, that's great. How am I going to take notes? I'm like, grab a pen kid, grab a pen kid. 
because I want them to walk in a room and look to the left and say, how was your weekend? Hey, how's your daughter doing that soccer game? Hey, how was your vacation? But instead we're this. And what are we doing? Do on two TikTok videos? Come on. Like we've got to connect better. So, uh, so there are some triggers I use to make sure that, that I can actually put the phone down. Um, I got my wife's got another one for me. Her name's Lisa. We married for 25 years. So we got married as kids. She was an intern at the Nets when I was an assistant. So that's where we met. Her. And um, if we'll be out of dinner, now I'm by the way, I'm not perfect at this, but so I, I got my phone out. I'm just checking the score, like meaningless stuff, but I wanted to see the score. <laughs> and she gives me this, like, just like, I'll wait. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I'm just, no, she, no, no, it's more important. I'll wait. I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, I'm just going to put my phone down and never pull it out of my pocket ever again. Yeah. As she's staring daggers right into my eyes. Um, so you do definitely need some people who will give you some real talk in your life. And I, I've got a few of those. But, um, but I, I just encourage everybody just to be where your feet are, be present. Like the whole world is happening out there. And, and I think if you have something meaningful to do on your phone, do it. You know, if you want to inspire people on your phone, do it. You want to put some good energy out into the world, do it. Otherwise, like, man, we need more meaningful moments with each other. I really, really believe that. And if one thing, if one thing COVID taught us was family dinners, time together, the importance of connection, all that stuff, like we can't lose it. You got to stick with it. You made a a really good point about, you know, getting, you know, uh, communicating with the people in the room with yourself. That's that's what you used to be when we were growing up. You were with, you were with, and you found out what other people did on Monday at school. I remember, and I've been involved in the NBA since the eighties, since you were. And so decades now, but I remember a shift in about, it was the early 2000s. It used to be teams. You leave the arena, you play the game, you leave the arena, you're on the bus with your teammates and your coaches, and you're on the plane with your teammates and your coaches until you get home before, before everybody was constantly on their phones. Now, guys, get on the plane, get on the uh, bus after the game, and they're immediately talking to people outside of the bus almost no communication on the bus, right? That's how it is. And we've got to, it, yes. it, it, it can take away from team bonding and team building. I know it's kind of hard to put that genie back. In no, the no, I, I love that. I'll, I'll tell you a, a great, a great story, which I don't know if it's true because I wasn't there, but it's one of my favorite stories. And if you ever have uh, Kevin Garnett on, I want you to ask him. Okay. okay. So here's the story. Right. He's trade to, to the Brooklyn Nets. It's a preseason game. They're down at halftime. He walks in. Two players are on their phones. He grabs one, throws it against a brick wall, and shatters it. It's like, get your head in the game. Like, first of all, that's very Kevin Garnett, right? So you can right, see yeah. that happening. On brand. But do you love that? Love it. Like, Just I'm love like, it. Yeah, that's my kind of guy. That's, that's right? 100% my kind of guy. Yeah. I heard another story. Again, you know, these are all kind of lore in the NBA. Is, is uh, one well-known coach um, was new to his team, and they, they dropped into New York. And he looks out on the tarmac, and there are a bunch of limos. He calls the team back on. He lets everybody off the plane, calls them back on the plane. He's like, yeah, send the limos home. You're going to the hotel. We're on a business trip. And I was like, whoa. So so I think there's a – yeah, yeah. I think there's a pretty interesting movement to to get to connect. We've we've seen um, issues all over the league with mental health. Right. A lot of it has to do with these guys. They're too young to be reading all this negative, all these negative things about themselves. Great. It's negatively impacting their ability to play. Yeah. And so you see a lot of players just say that I'm not, I'm off for the, I'm off for the season, um, which I like. I, I, I just did. want them to be healthy and, and optimize their performance and, and self-actualize. I really do. I, I think that the, the modern day player, they're special. I mean, they're, they're more globally aware. They're smarter. They're, yeah. they're in tune with the world. In some ways, that's wonderful, but every strength you have is often a liability, right? Yeah. So if you're really hardworking, sometimes you don't find the right balance and do the right things, you know? If you're really passionate, sometimes you overreact, you know? If you're really in tune with the world, maybe sometimes you don't uh, disconnect and actually kind of connect with your feelings. So I, I think there's a there's some of that for sure. And I, I did want to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah. I mean, can I have the, oh, the floor at least? Of course. Okay, a couple quick quick basketball ones. Yeah. The guy you hated most in college. Uh, that player you hated most in college. Hated playing against. You played against. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, oof. 
you know, I don't know. I, I hated playing against Vernon Maxwell because he was so good. Uh, if that was the, if that's kind of the question, it was really not, yeah, I don't think there was anybody I really hated. Also, I was only in college for a minute. Vernon <laughs> <laughs> right. Maxwell Burn was so good. Um, he, 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 so fast. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. What else? Come on, fire away. All right. Uh, the guy you did not want guarding you in the NBA. Like he, you saw every time you saw him, you're like, not tonight. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a little more difficult. I, and I, I faced from Michael Cooper to MJ to Scotty, Joe Dumars, great defenders. The one guy though, and it was also because of the era, the one guy that it was, it was impossible because he was so big and so fast and so strong and you could hold and grab was Dennis. Yeah, yeah. There were times Dennis, they put young Dennis out there, you know, on me right. on, the, on the wing. Warm. And, he was the warm and, at that time. Yeah. I mean, my, my God, Dennis was just, he was in, insanely long and athletic and, and, I mean, guy could have, should have been a sprinter, a world-class 100, 200 kind of guy, you know, 6'10 in that just stride. But, yeah, Dennis was Dennis was the real deal. All right. Does Josh have any kind of hoop game? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking well, – you, you're a point guard. You guys would – I am. Yeah, he's, he's pick and roll. He's pick and roll, just so you know. Well, what's so, my what's my true gift, Rex? Well, it's I'm true the best. Gift. I'm the he's, best at one thing. He's the I, best of anyone. He's the best inbounder I've ever seen. Fake yeah. a pass to make a pass. It's a real specialty mm. thing, but yeah. He, that, yeah, there you go. He knows. You know, that's yeah. a, that's a nuance. It's a it's a nuance it's in the a, game mm, that's, that's right. oftentimes overlooked. See, it's a gift too. I was born with it. And, I and was always good at the smack the ball. <laughs> always good at that like, smack. And throw it in and bounce pass. I could whatever it took. That's I right. was still a hell of an inbounder. And and it's not yeah. you, you don't even have to be in shape for it. Right. And, no, and but but I was a, I'm a professional and I was always in pretty good shape because <laughs> I didn't want to get tired when I was faking passes. Yeah. <laughs> so inbounding is really my game. Oh. The lead inbounder. I, yeah. All right, one more, one more. Story. All right. All right. All right. Favorite moment post playing career mine yeah yeah my favorite mo personal moment personal moment oh man uh for sure getting off of uh painkillers uh yeah, that's yeah. my yeah that's got to be the biggest one at that point just yeah that was that was pretty difficult and yeah so i think that's probably my favorite personal moment because that was a life that was going down the tubes pretty pretty quickly yeah so yeah, that one. Um, yeah, what about, you? what about you? Favorite personal moment? I mean, I have so many, mostly related to family. I had a couple of really special ones this weekend. I, I married my nephew, um, Jer, who, whose uh, father has passed away. And, um, so wow. I it was kind of like a, I have three Isn't daughters. So he's, <laughs> well, he hey. Made, <laughs> that's what makes it so exciting. You, know, that's you why married your moment. nephew? This is interesting. <laughs> this took a turn I didn't no, see. Get the book. <laughs> no, sorry. Go ahead. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to skip to that chapter. Up, like, I, I, <laughs> no, I've been to so many weddings and I never, I mean, I was in front marrying him. I took a course online and then, wow. you know, it was just, a, it was a special moment with a, with a Jeremy and Tara who I just absolutely love. And, uh, you know, that was probably, at least recently, that was, that was one of those things I'll, oh, I'll never forget. That's amazing. Uh, hey, what, uh, I got another question. What, what biggest lessons you've learned along the way working, you learned along the way working for David Stern? For so oh, man. Yeah. So if those of your listeners that do not know him, um, <laughs> he, he uh, sadly, sadly has passed away. Yes. Um, and was a mentor. I saw him two weeks before he passed away. I, 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 I love him. Um, I owe so much of my career and success to him. And, um, but he was a tyrant and the meanest man I've ever met in my life. Like he called me things I had to look up. Like I didn't even understand what he was saying because he was so mean and nasty and in my face screaming and yelling. Um, but boy, was he brilliant. I mean, we would get on a plane and he was so nasty. Everybody would run for the back. I was so young. 
I was like, hey, this is the best guy in the history of the business. I'm sitting across from him. And I would take the pounding for sure on a trip. But man, it was just wisdom. And I, anyway, but he would be on a plane and he would have eight, nine inches of articles ripped out, um, which I loved him. He's just a lifelong learner. In fact, in one, one trip, this is probably 2001, 2002. He's like, and he would always like punk you all the time, like about everything, your wife, your way you went to school, where, you know, what you ate, you know, that you're eating too much, whatever it was, like you could, no holds bar. He said anything you wanted at any time. He's like, you think you're so smart? I was like, nope. You know? And he's like, you probably don't even know what with you. And I was like, I have not. Now it was Wi-Fi, but he was so far ahead of the game. Nobody ever said it. He'd only read it. Like Whiffy. that's how far I <laughs> <Whiffy. laughs> And so I killed him for that 10 years later. Killed him. Um, but, but remember, like, Whiffy. this is the guy who, like, this is a guy who studied HIV, was connected to the best doctors in the world. So that when, when Magic Johnson contracted the virus, he didn't run for cover like everybody else was. He said, hey, let's solve this together. And let's use this as a platform to drive global change. This is a guy who put an office in China in the 80s yeah. where the NFL tried to put a game on in China about eight years ago and couldn't pull it off. So, like, he was so far ahead. I mean, he, t- I mean, he is, uh, man, attention to detail. We, I remember we had this one, one meeting. I, I ran a couple groups for him, and we were putting on this one meeting for a lot of league executives. And, um, and, and <clears throat> the, you know, we, the name tags were left at the hotel instead of the venue. He walked in, and he, I just remember him screaming. And whenever he would scream, I would get calm. I, I don't know if it's like dealing with crazy coaches or not, but, like, I never reacted. I was just listening for the message. You'd be, you know, toe to toe. You know those guys just screaming. Yeah. And I'd be like, okay. I said, David, I know everybody in this room. I know what you're frustrated about. It's because you don't want to be embarrassed not knowing anybody. He's like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, expletive, expletive. You know, F you, F you. And I was like, okay, I'm going to stand right by you. And he's like, and then he'd like pit people against each other. Is it you or you? And I was like, let's just solve the problem. I mean, he was that guy. It was, man. Wow. It was hard. Cool. No, I remember one you, time, last story, last story, I swear. These are I get off the plane, the phone rings, and I just, I mean, I was working for the teams, like on behalf of the teams as a consultant. So I would like go see a team and send them a report. Now I'd go to a team and send them a report. Him, the commissioner, I was like 30 years old, okay? Wow. And I sent him one report, and it was like, it was, you know, I, I take very, I have very strong opinions, okay? And, and that's how I write. I write with, Good. he didn't like something in, in that report. So I, and I'm traveling to three cities a week. I mean, I'm traveling all the time. I land. And it was those old flip phones. Remember those big flip phones? So I had a little flip phone. I literally step off the plane in Detroit, the phone rings. And it's like, you mother effort, you son of a... And I was like, mom, he <laughs> lost his mind. <laughs> Do you know who this is? Do you know who this is? You're boss. That's who it is. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, David. Hey, hey, what's up? And uh, I like, get back to New York. <laughs> and, uh, that's real i mean that is like you know and i i mean i you know you could tell i i i, I he loved he he loved the debate he, he did not love that moment but but he loved to, to battle he loved to debate i mean loved to learn he had incredible attention to detail he was a visionary saw the world uh, before anybody else saw it and he he was not he was a renaissance man like he you know, like you expect him to be the best in the world at sports marketing or the best in the world at basketball or the best in the world at the NBA. And he was all those things. But just I love the notion of him understanding like geopolitical stuff and life sciences and technology and the venture and finance world. And he's just, man, brilliant, wonderful soul. And I will tell you this because I don't want to sound like um, I, I'm not grateful there. I went through some periods in my life where I really struggled. First guy, always whatever you need. I'm here for you. Let me help you. Let me make five phone calls to help you. Like that guy, man, he's, he's he was as good as they come. Did he ever, I, I that brilliant was my man. question. That was my question. Thank you for sharing those stories. That was just fantastic. Um, and I knew David a little bit. So, and I knew, I knew his relationship with my guy, David Falk. So there you go. I know. Yeah. yeah. They had <laughs> conversation. yeah. So, but, um, you said he'd always be there for you in, in the worst moments. Was he able to show, was he able to show love uh, and decompress? Was he nice at times? Could he be, or was that really not in his DNA? When he, when he got older, 
Um, and so I was there for almost eight years. So I got him later in his career. And so I got more of him thinking about legacy and thinking about his relationship with his family and thinking about, you know, how he would do some things differently and how, you know, um, so, so yes, there were times when he was calm for sure, okay. but relaxed, never. I mean, he, he told me that he woke up every day convinced he had no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> convinced he wasn't smart enough, convinced he wasn't. Good enough. And, that, and I, I can identify with that. I had yeah. that little chip on my shoulder too. Yeah. He once told me too, he said, if I had, cause I used to tell him like, you should write a book. Like you should have somebody read you a book. Like I would read that book in two minutes. And he said, if I wrote a book, it'd be called uh, episodic micromanagement is underrated. And I was like, well, I'm not sure I read that one. And then, said, <laughs> and then, and then he said, or, 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 or I'd call it fear and intimidation and how to get the best out of people. I'm like, I'm not sure I read that one either. I mean, he was unbelievable, like, he, but he had this charm. Like he was like that, but he was charming. You just loved him. You wanted to work harder for him. You wanted him to be happy and pleased. And and uh, I once, I was once at this conference. I could go on for this all day. I swear, I'll cut this short. I was at this conference once, and I was up doing my thing. And he called me up, and in front of this is like two thousand people. It's big NBA meetings. He calls up. He said, "And I, I want to say that uh, uh, Scott O'Neill, you've done a nice job. Uh, can you come up here?" And I was like. Like I, I know. And so the only thing that my friends kill me about this still to this day. So I walk up and I'm kind of like uncomfortable. Like I hadn't gotten a confidence. I've worked for him for six years. I'd never heard him say anything nice other than you idiot. I thought that was my name. And he said, uh, I said, Hey, uh, I mean, thank you. I mean, you throw compliments around like they're manhole covers. <laughs> That's the only thing I can get out of my my uh, my mouth at times so it's great that was uh, not well received either to be I'm honest sure. with you. I know. but uh, yeah. i i i love i love him to this day i love the memories of him i love working for him the, the nba league office is an elite place with elite people today um and it's it's just step and adam silver who's a, a dear friend and somebody i have a ton of respect for is one of the greats of all time yeah what's what's there obviously different styles how do they contrast oh they're very different yeah they're very different um david was was much more combative debate and adam is much more relationship solve the problem and i think um david was the perfect guy at the perfect time and i think adam is the perfect guy at the perfect time it's really interesting to see how the how the world has shifted and you know i, I look at how the nba was able to navigate the bubble and i just i marvel. And I, and I don't think that was a time to fight. I think that was a time to embrace and talk and listen and leverage relationships, both with ESPN and Turner and the players. And, and you know, I, I look at the, uh, the Donald Sterling transition that Adam uh, jammed. And I think, man, you know, maybe David could have done that. I'm sure he could have, but Adam did it. And he did it a different way, you know. It wasn't uh, embarrassed Sterling. It was like, okay, you did the wrong thing. I'm taking the team. We're going to move on. Um, you know, I look at the way the league has handled the social justice movement, which I'm so proud to be a part so of. Proud, be like, right? yeah, honestly, to my soul, it's to my soul, I love it. And, and I think the way that that's happening is a product of who Adam Silver is at the core. Um, so, so I think, you, you know, they're so different, um, but they have a lot of things in common. One is they're both tough as nails. Two, they're both – as brilliantly smart as any two people you'll ever meet in your life. And three at the end, they, they've sacrificed themselves and their lives for the good of the game. That I love, you know? And so, so they're really good people. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. This is completely unrelated. Didn't think I'd ask this, but you're impressed me so much and you're a positive guy, obviously in such an intellect. What are we going to do in this country? What, to solve this great divide right now. What are your thoughts on that? And how can we, how can we repair this? Yeah, such a, such a rich question. Um, I, there's a, there's a great um, a, a short on Netflix called, um, boy, The Social Dilemma. And if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. And so it takes these executives from all the social media companies and interviews them. And at the end of the movie, um, they had this one guy, I can't remember the social media thing. They look him right in the camera and they said, okay, so what happens? Like now what? 
And what they're asking them now what to do is that we all curate our own media. Okay. So now we have not only 7.5 million media members in the world, we're also 7.5 million people who are deciding what we want to see and how we want to see it. So what that's doing is it's, it's polarizing all of us. And so you either listen to Fox or CNN when actually what we want is NBC, if you will, you know? Um, and so this guy looks right dead at the camera and he says civil war. And literally like it almost like burned him. So, um, and then obviously we had a lot of issues um, after the George Floyd murder. So um, I will say like, I'm not sure that the solution is quick, um, but what I, what I love about Joe Biden in office is my wife asked me the other day, and I, I got to know him a little bit just because uh, he's from Delaware. Um, it's close by Sixer fam. And, um, and he, he, she said, well, what's Joe Biden up to anyway? And I said, it's kind of nice not to have him in our face every day, isn't it? You know? And she said, you're right. It is. And, and I think, um, I look, I'm so proud to be an American. I am. I'm, you know, my, my grandfather on one side and my great grandfather on the other side came over from Ireland and Italy and they didn't have a nickel when they came here. And I look at the opportunity the country afforded my, me, my, my parents, um, my children, um, I look at all the opportunity here. I travel all over the world and there's no place I'd rather be in America. Okay. When I listen to the anthem, put my hand over my heart. I'm very proud to be here. We just have a long way to go. And you know, there's something special about that because our expectations are higher and they should be like how much, you know, in Lithuania, how high are their expectations? Not as high as ours, you know? Um, so I, I, I have hope. I, I love the next generation. I love the millennials. And I love the next generation coming under them. I spent a lot of time with young kids and they see the world so differently. They, they honestly, like they almost can't believe the way we see the world. Just like we were disappointed with our parents and disgusted with our grandparents in terms of how they saw the world. I'm seeing these young generations looking at us and saying like, you got a long way to go, buddy. Yeah. And I, I love that. Like, I love their hope. I love their spirit. I love that they want to believe in something bigger than themselves. I love that they want to change the world. I love that their social contract is different. It's like, really, you're not going to do this. You're not going to make a difference. I'm out. Oh, uh, really? So I can't pay rent. So what? I'll figure it out. I love this next group. They're willing to work and they have better vision. We've got to get through these next, next 10, 15 years and get this next generation up and running this country. And I'm excited about answer. that. Um, yeah. And, and how do we, how do we stop like the, the, you know, it's like, I think social media gives us like such a polarizing edge um, where it's, it's like the vocal minority. I, I, I the big thing about like two things I say at work is like, one is I want to manage the top 5%, not the bottom five. And I say, I don't want the vocal minority dictating policy. And, and I think right now what social media gives you is a vocal minority dictating policy. So the stuff you're seeing online is what you think is the, the majority and it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fringes. The fringes are getting attention. You know why? Because that's what gets retweets. Fringes get retweets. You, you say something more ridiculous, people want to repost it and reshare it. And, um, and, I, and I think the, the amount of misinformation and disinformation is causing more mistrust and distrust than we need. And we need to go back to some really like core values that nobody wants to talk about, like honesty and trust and transparency, like simple, Amen. simple things that we learned about in kindergarten. We need to kind of come back to our roots and find those. Great answer. It's a tough question, and that's a great answer. And uh, thank you. Yeah, Scott, buddy, can't thank you enough for stopping by this week. Josh, wait, favorite movie, maybe? Scott. Yeah, Scott, what's your uh, what's your favorite movie? Okay, Family Man and Fletch. Fletch. <laughs> 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 nice, nice. Oh, love Put it. it on the other hills. It's all ball bearings these days. It really um, is. <laughs> and then uh, front row center for any. Uh, it could be you know a band, a speaker, dead or alive. You, you front row center. Martin Luther King. Mm. Well done. I love it, Scott. Listen, man, uh, what you've done restoring, rebuilding, rebranding the Sixers, where they were a few years ago, to now uh, NBA's biggest season ticket base. 
unbelievable. Your book, Be Where Your Feet Are. Be sure and get it, everybody. Scott, please come back. Will you come back and do this again with us? Please. I would love it. I appreciate you guys. And if you ever want to hit a game, let's go. In, let's go. Mm. Road careful, trip. Let's careful. Go, let's go. Road trip. Yes, yes, let's sir. All right. Thanks, John. Love to have you. Hey, Thanks, I appreciate John. all the things you're doing, guys. Thank Keep you, buddy. It's been work. a pleasure. Thanks for joining yes. us. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, right back at you. Thanks. See ya. Well, I say it every time, Josh. Wow. I mean, I, you know, I, both of us, you know, we were a little nervous over this one going in because, you know, this is a little outside of our wheelhouse and we knew how smart this guy was, right? Yeah. But he's smarter he than we thought. He didn't disappoint. No, he's smarter. <laughs> I could have listened to him talk about David Stern and Adam Silver for four hours. You can see you can see why he's a success, right? Oh, I mean, I'll bet he gets up at four o'clock in the morning every day and works out and then visits children in the hospital and then meditates and then, you know, helps people starving somewhere and then gets to work at seven and works all day and goes home. And then he loves his wife and children more than I love anyone in the world. He does. He truly does make me feel like shit. He does. <laughs> He's amazing. <laughs> he is an amazing cat. He really is. I mean, mm -hmm. and you know, as as we know in his in his book, which we're gonna read, of course. We finally, we have a book club we book, right? Book club. Uh, I gotta tell you, I was like, I was like, I don't know if I read this book. Now I'm like, I am definitely definitely reading, reading it. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Be where your feet are. Seven principles to keep your Keep you present, grounded, and thriving by Scott O'Neill. I can't. I can't wait. Um, I'm. I just like and I enjoy. And he has. Yeah, I remember Scott being with the Nets from back when I joined the Hornets. Right. Just coming up, coming up as a young guy. So, uh, just fascinating. Life's like he said. Life is hard, man. No matter mm -hmm. where you are, life is hard. So. And whatever. I was totally blown away. Had no idea. You did. I'm sure that. David Stern was such a cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God. He, he, he's I a had no idea. Yeah, he he was he was a renowned prick. Oh wow! I mean, brilliant, obviously, and oh, yeah. people really like him. That's a oh, real yeah. that's a skill to be that big of a dick, and people really like you. Yeah, yeah, he handled mm -hmm. his business a different way, like he said. Like you, you. I'm a dick. You're a dick, but eh, people don't really like you. Yeah, yeah, full dick, just full dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, buddy, that's been fun. Uh, let's get out of here. Same time next week, powered by basketballnews.com, the Rex Chapman Show with super cool Josh Hopkins. Subscribe, rate, and review. We're out.